This is Miriam Shulman, author of the book, Artpreneur and host of the Inspiration Place podcast. I am so glad that you're here with me today. One of the things that I do inside my book, Artpreneur, is I do make sure that I include all kinds of artists, not just white European male artists like Picasso and Matisse that we've heard a million times, but really introduce you to artists that you may not be as familiar with, like Alice Neal or Julie Moretu, who's an Ethiopian born artist. And that's why I'm so excited by the art that I'm sharing with you today that I saw in 2022 at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And today we're talking all about representing the Black experience in art. I'm going to share with you, it was Winslow Homer and a Why Born Enslaved, uh, Hear Me Now, Afrofuturism, so those four exhibits. So to dive into that, stay tuned. Since the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent global social justice movement that followed, museums are doubling down on correcting the disparity between the representation. So there are museums that are selling off their white male art and actually collecting art by more marginalized groups, which I think is a wonderful thing. And you are seeing a more representation inside some of these exhibits. And it's been a lot of fun to see this, that we're seeing um, not only the Black experience, but more work by marginalized groups, artists of color, and working to fix the disparity, disparity between men and women's representation in the art. So these are all great things, which is why you're hearing a lot about these types of exhibits, because right now there's a correction going on. Museums are working hard to reset the balance and include more artists of color and more women in their shows. This exhibit features the pottery of enslaved artisans in South Carolina. Now, what really impressed me in person about this exhibit is the scale of these pots. They're enormous. So if you like Restoration Hardware, which now calls itself RH, if you like the very large scale contemporary things you see there, and they have planters on the RH site that are huge, I think actually the ones in this exhibit are larger. And that's incredible considering that these slaves who created it, they would have to lift this. Now, the one who created these enormous pots, his name was Dave. And after he was emancipated, he took the last name Drake. So Dave Drake. They shared that this slave actually had lost a leg later in life. So moving these very large bowls and vessels were something that was physical, that was hard to even imagine. Now, they did allude that this leg seems to have been lost under mysterious circumstances. So, you know, he he was enslaved as a potter, not as a farmer or working with machines. And since he continued to write, inscribing poetry on his pots, reading and writing, which was banned for slaves in the Deep South, it's possible that his leg was removed forcibly for running afoul of what was considered criminal during this time. Now, the curators also showed the pottery, not just of this era of these slaves, but they also showed modern parts by mid-century Black artists. And they also showed examples of art from indigenous people in Africa. So it's very interesting to see the influences from both the past and the future of these enslaved artists, like how the whole spectrum of the history, everything kind of influences each other. One pot I particularly liked was the cobalt blue glazed pot. So imagine a vase that's glazed it's almost like a turquoise cobalt blue, but then it has nose and lips with very, very ethnic proportion. So I really liked that one. I also really liked the face vessels. These reminded me of one of my clients. So Inga Vandenhoven creates very interesting anthropomorphic pottery. And it also reminded me of 
the pots that you might see done by Jonathan Adler, where he creates planters and vases that have faces on them. So you can see the influence on other artists. One thing that was very interesting in the narratives that the curators did is really created a conversation around this. And the exhibit really forces us to ask, what is art when it's the product of coercion? So you would think that artistry is antithetical to enslavement, but when you actually look at the objects in this exhibit, you can see that the artists actually had a lot of agency over their art, especially in the case of Dave the Potter. Dave the Potter, who later took the name Dave Drake after emancipation, there's definitely a boldness in his writing on the on the pottery, because as an artist, he's basically committing, as I said before, a crime because he's going against what was the law and he's doing it in his artwork. I think that's making an incredible statement. Okay, so what did you think of these vessels? This is something that you would actually want to include in your home because I looked at it and I thought, holy cow, this is fantastic. I just absolutely love this art, not just from a historical perspective, but I just like it. So I would love to hear what you think. Share your thoughts in the comments below. On my visit to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I went to a new exhibit in the period rooms. They created a brand new exhibit. It's called Afrofuturism. And it was there that I learned about the history of Seneca Village, which I really didn't know too much about. Seneca Village was a vibrant 19th century community of predominantly Black landowners and tenants. And it flourished in this area just west of the Met, which is now Central Park. By the 1950s, this village comprised of about 50 homes, three churches, multiple cemeteries, a school, and many gardens. It was an escape from the crowded and dangerous confines of Lower Manhattan and a site of opportunity, ownership, freedom, and prosperity. However, in 1857, to make way for the park, the city used eminent domain, another word for manifest destiny or white supremacy. <laughs> they used eminent domain to seize Seneca Village land, displacing its residents and leaving only the barest traces of the community behind. And although I'm not talking about it today, New York has also displaced the Lenape Native Americans. I don't have research about that today, but this is the first time I had learned about the Seneca Village when I was visiting this Afrofuturism period room. So when you visit the Metropolitan Museum, know that there's this dark history behind it. I'm not going to love the Metropolitan any less. I love it so much. But it does make me sad to know that these people were forcibly removed from their homes in order to make way for it. So this exhibit that I saw was a way to bring awareness to this. And the title is Before Yesterday We Could Fly. And what they try to do is imagine, so Afrofuturism is imagining, well, what could have been and what would have been with the arts that were happening in Seneca Village and moving it into the present day. I came across an exhibit called Why Born Enslaved, Fictions of Emancipation, Carpo Recast. It's the first ex exhibition at the Met to re-examine Western sculpture in relation to the histories of transatlantic slavery, colonialism, and empire. The exhibit is organized around this marble bust by French sculptor Jean-Baptiste Carpeau. So he's a 19th century sculptor. One point I read that he was the most famous in France, but I'm pretty sure Rodin was sculpting at the same time. That aside, let's just focus on Carpeau. He created this bust after American emancipation and some 20 years after slavery was abolished by the French Atlantic. It's basically popularizing the 
anti-slavery imagery, but yet at the same time using a slave to do that. So there's a little bit of a conflict here. So when I first came across this exhibit, I wasn't sure what to make of it. I wasn't sure if I'm supposed to be enjoying these, <laughs> these images, if I should be outraged by these images. And I have to tell you, I went to it, then I went to, I went to visit the POTS, then I came back and I looked at it again, then I went to the Afro Future Room, then I came back again. And the third visit that I came back, I began to relax because what I did was I looked around and I was looking at the other people who were enjoying the sculpture. And I was looking at how much all the Black people who were there were enjoying the sculpture because it is so unusual to see examples of African people done by Western artists in this really highlighting their true beauty. The women and the men in this exhibit, they had true African ethno features, and they were beautiful. They were absolutely beautiful, but they were depicted as slaves. So there was still a little bit of that kind of niggly feeling for me. In addition to Carpo's bust, which, which is really beautiful, the woman, she has a twisted motion. She has kinky hair. Um, she has a wide nose, full lips. They show her breasts. There's a rope around her. Her. So it's a very erotic image. It's definitely a black woman. It definitely shows her as a slave. They're not sure of the identity of the person who posed for her, but they do suspect who it was. So I did see that information shared. But in addition to that sculpture, there are other sculptures in this exhibit. And some of them, I think, were even more beautiful than that one. One thing that was very interesting is Kara Walker, who is a contemporary Black artist. She actually had did a reverse molding of this image. So that was a very interesting object that they had in there. There was also a bust done by Kahind Wiley. So that name, if it's not familiar to you, he did the... Obama portrait that's in the Smithsonian, but he did actually a marble bust. And what he did was he did an African-American man, but posed in the same way as this woman that twisted motion. So you know that it referenced the Carpo sculpture, but then he put a Nike logo on a tank top on this figure. So I'm assuming he's trying to say that there's some sort of enslavement to being an entertainer as a black person in the world. I'm not really sh completely sure what he's trying to say, but he's definitely trying to say something. And it was beautiful. One of my favorite pieces, though, was a sculpture that had black and white marble. It doesn't say what the materials were, but the head and shoulders were done in some sort of black material. And then there was white marble used on the drapes, uh, with what it's called the toga of this slave person. And then the earrings were gold. It, it was just so absolutely stunning. It was an absolutely beautiful piece of art. Like I said, I do have mixed feelings about these pieces. They are all beautiful pieces of art. I do think that the French artist was grasping a little bit with their identity. You know, they had the revolution going on, they had abolition going on, but there is still, it's still an example of male virility, which I think that's also maybe why I find it troubling. So, you know, it's still eroticizing a woman in bondage. And at the end of the day, that I still have, I still have a little trouble with that. Yeah, so we're representing a figure, but it's still linked to the idea of slavery and the link to the idea of being chained. So it's still perpetuating the same images and the still idea of blackness as being slavery. And that's what it meant for the society. So that's why I'm a little bit torn. I don't want to denounce this art. I mean, I think the intent of Carpo at that time was an anti slavery image, but you do have to think about, you know, what these images are saying to people. Because all at the end of the day, what you're looking at is a black woman who is being bound by ropes. All right. So I'm just wondering what you have to say about this. So you can comment below.
All right. Winslow Homer at age 26 was a professional artist reporter. His drawings were often reproduced in the illustrated press. He aspired, however, to be a painter. Now, Sharpshooter was his first oil painting, completed in 1863. And that was in the public eye with an engraving of a soldier in Harper's Weekly. So I went to this exhibit, Winslow Homer Cross Currents, with two Artist Incubator Mastermind members, wildlife artist Priya Gore, who's been, who was traveling from Australia, and Shane D. Halperin, a Judaic artist who lives in New York. Some of the paintings we loved, some of the paintings not so much. We were pretty critical. And one painting, though, that all three of us could agree on that we all loved was Cotton Pickers. So again, we have a depiction of two African slaves picking cotton. I do think that Winslow Homer was very sympathetic to the black experience. You can see that in all of his paintings, that he definitely did not romanticize slavery. He captured the emotional experience of the people. You could see the hurt. You can see the anger on these two women's faces. So I felt that portrait was very modern, very prescient. It was also a gorgeous painting, though. The sky is filled with a pink sunset, all fluffy clouds. You have the fluffy cotton fields. And the two women are shown very close up, and it's really a portrait of them. Other artworks that stood out in this exhibit definitely also showed the violence of nature and the the violence of nature. And I wonder if that was used more as a metaphor because oftentimes he would depict a black man like on a ship with a with a shark circling it. Yeah, I want I wonder what he intended with that. Now as a war painter, Homer was uncomfortable with battle scenes. He painted only one, but he didn't really paint in the way other war painters would paint. So He mostly showed us the weary, homesick men in the camp. And that's also, I think, why he chose to depict, okay, so what does it mean now for these, for the people who were enslaved, who were about to be emancipated? That is a lot of his focus. The other thing that I thought very interesting about Winslow Homer is that I felt his watercolors were way better in technique than his oil paintings. And he also agreed with that. There was one part of the exhibit the curators wanted to let you know that Homer himself suspected that the watercolors were his greater legacy. All right, my friends. So if you like videos like this that really dig deep into art historical perspectives, give the video a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments below what other types of videos you would like to see. I'd love to hear from you and I'd love to connect. Okay, so thanks so much for joining me. And don't forget, you can order Artpreneur now. It is in bookstores starting January 31st. And you can even ask your local library if they will carry it for you. Okay, my friend, until the next time, stay inspired.